Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I'm here today with Michael, and we have uh, we have two films that, this is kind of a hard one, because I don't want to say anything mean. Two right? films with British voiceover. Okay. All right, great. Done deal. I guess it's films that, uh, let's say they best represent the very things they are stealing from. Great. Does that sound? That I love sounds, it. That's right. a great premise. First of all, what are the movies, and then what are they doing? We're going to do, uh, we're going to do Doomsday and Equilibrium, and we're going to talk about how they... Um, borrow how about homage they pay yes, homage, homage to there other films that other Great. people may accuse them of stealing from a lot of people ask the question especially of these two movies is it okay to steal this much from mm-hmm. other sources you know when we were pairing this up i always think in my mind of doomsday as a movie that um that is very directly taking things you know from other movies and Equilibrium, a movie that takes from less things, maybe it takes a little... They take about the same amount, right? Pretty much. They're both directly stealing. Yeah, maybe from, not from movies, but they're definitely stealing. Right, right. And so, you know, people ask if it's okay to borrow this much. And so I think these movies actually answer that question. I think you can watch these two movies, and this is great for the people who follow along with our show and they watch the movies before they listen. Would you change anything about these movies? Would you rather they didn't steal from the source? Would you rather they didn't exist? I don't think you would. Yep. I think you want these movies to exist. I Absolutely. think it's good that they do. And so we're just going to give them a complete pass on what they're stealing, but yeah. we're going to talk about that a bit. Yeah, we're going to spoil them too. Yeah, so we'll talk about some of the source material, not a whole lot, um, but we're going to talk about the entire content of the yep. movie start to finish, and in doing that, we're probably going to spoil the endings and, and heavy plot stuff. So if you haven't seen the movie yet, you can use the chapters to, uh, we'll do Doomsday first, and you can skip over Doomsday and go to Equilibrium. Um, and you know what? Once you get to that point, if you haven't seen Equilibrium, skip to the end of the show. And we're doing another weird thing next week. Yeah, I'm watching two movies next week. Hooray for odd movie selection. So this is the position we're in, as usual on the show. I'm sick again. Yeah. Always sick. And as we were watching Doomsday, in fact, um, we, had to, we had to watch Doomsday and then come back a couple of days later and finish Equilibrium because I just couldn't. I don't even remember anything that happened yeah. on the day that we watched Doomsday. So I'm just going to let you take the lead on this because oh, you've seen it. Doomsday about 5,000 times. Yeah, five or six. I've seen it times. twice, and I think my memory is ha- hazy of, uh, of both occurrences. Mm-hmm. This is also great because maybe you'll talk a bit more and people forget that I'm sick, yeah. and that'll be good too. That's not a bad plan. All right, tell me about Doomsday. All right, so Doomsday is a Neil Marshall film. Mm. We covered Neil Marshall, what, three times? A Two other times. times. Right. Well, there was Dog Soldiers. Dog Soldiers. And The Descent. And Doomsday was his third film. and uh, The last of the D films. The last of the D films. So we've covered Neil Marshall probably more than we really need to keep <laughs> doing. But Not I just, true. I fucking Never true. love this guy. So he's part of what we've discerned as the Splat Pack, which is a group of directors that aren't afraid to get down and dirty and bloody. What were the shows particularly where we highlighted the Splat Pack stuff? Uh, well, we talked about... Alex Aha when we did P2 and The Hills Have Eyes. Sure. And then, that was not a double feature. Though. Right. Those were two separate, two separate films. Right. And then we also did um, Neil Marshall with Dog Soldiers in the Descent, mm. Eli Roth back when oh, we sure. did Hostel and Cabin Fever. Before the term Splat Pack was even on right, our show. Right. I have a feeling we might have covered it a bit when we talked about Inside for yeah, some reason. It I don't seems remember about why. right to do yeah. that. So we won't really heavily go into the Splat Pack stuff. Right. I kind of forget that Neil Marshall is part of that. Yeah. Because while The Descent was uh, kind of bloody, kind of gory, definitely a horror film, Mm -hmm. um, and Dog Soldiers would fall into horror too, Doomsday for some reason just strikes me more as action than horror. Well, the thing about Doomsday is that there's a lot of, and this is kind of the, the crux of the entire show today, is that there's a lot of homage and genre kind of there's lines blurred right in right. the in the uh, genre field yeah but I think most importantly to note is the homage factor and the two films that I can definitely say Doomsday draws from is Escape from New York and Mad Max sure I see both of those two film we've covered Escape from New York on the show we yeah. paired that with 
religious, religious, I believe that are expelled. It was one yeah. of the two. And Doomsday is down to protagonist with eye patch, yeah, quarantine zone with the shitty computer and yeah, you're synthesizer right. It's, it's score. pretty much the same thing. It, right? It's just it's a great setup, and yeah. I, and and fortunately, the film is aware mm. that it's borrowing. From Escape from New York, it's not trying to hide the fact that there's a similar... There's no shame in it. Exactly. And that's what makes it work. That's what makes showing the shitty DAT screen with green boats yeah, fucking yep. okay yeah. with helicopter noises and single John Carpenter synthesizer notes. Well, and the eye patch too. The I eye mean, patch. They, they sort of elevate that. There's a reason for it. You know, it's not just Snake Bliskin has an eye patch. Right. But now the eye patch is a piece of interesting technology right. that can Bionic be Bionic used... eye. Used throughout the film. Yeah. And the film also dabbles in... There's... Uh, dabbles. The film also <laughs> does a medieval thing. Sure. And there's the... Wow. Were you going to use a more subtle term like dabbles? I for, can't believe... Yeah. There's horses. It, it definitely... There's no the dabbling. Castle. There's no dabbling in that Do you that know there castle. was a scene cut out of this movie of uh, one of the modern day helicopters attacking the castle? Yeah. I did know that. That's amazing. Yeah. And the other thing... There's like the epidemic side story, which is kind of the bookends of the film it's yeah. it's what's going on but it's never what's happening yeah it's the cause for the the main the bulk of the film right and i think the the part of the film that appeals to me most is the final road exploitation scene sure um but the thing that i really like about doomsday at borrowing from the the road exploitation scene is that it does all the exploitation shit in a 2008 package yeah it's all kind of surrounded by shiny cars and helicopters and hot chicks and digital cameras right you don't get to see it this way very often exactly but you still get sword fights blood fucking cars yeah evil government agencies right. and cannibals right. yeah all of this in a shiny pretty welcome to the new millennium package you also get modern malcolm mcdowell that's which true. goes hand in hand with castles yeah, for some reason apparently i didn't imagine malcolm mcdowell in a medieval setting yeah it but, works uh, amazingly yeah doesn't it it it's, really does it's almost a little eerie yeah i was gonna say surreal but it's not surreal because it fits mm -hmm. so perfectly <laughs> true. he's just the the lord of the castle king of the yeah, castle hanging out no big deal malcolm mcdowell i imagine that's what he does in his free time he probably owns a castle but the so so talking about something unlike the exquisite fit of Malcolm McDowell in a castle. Cannibal dance. Oh, right. Yeah. There's the scene in this film. It is my favorite scene in the entire film. Possibly my favorite scene in 2008. Is the scene I call the cannibal dance. That was not a good year for dance movies. So. That's true. I believe that was step up two. I don't, I don't actually have any idea what happened in 2008. Can we talk about Eden for a second? Yes. That's uh, Rona Mitra? Yeah. This was really confusing to me when I saw the, the original trailer for Doomsday. This uh -huh. was another one of my birthday movies. Yes, it was. Right? These miraculous movies that come out on my birthday every year for some bizarre reason. So we went and saw this in, uh, I guess, the first week of April. And going into this, I didn't know that it wasn't... Kate Beckinsale. Kate Beckinsale of, of course, the Underworld uh -huh. movies. Um, or every once in a while in the trailer, kind of looks like Evangeline Lilly, yeah, who was Lost. in Lost. And uh, very bizarre, but Rona's popped up in a lot of stuff since this. Mm -hmm. I think Doomsday was, I mean, I don't know enough about her career to say it was a breakout movie for her yeah. or anything, but I get the feeling a lot of people didn't know about her before she was the, you know, action heroine here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she's awesome. She does a great job. But you were talking about Cannibal Dance, I yeah, think. Yeah, right. So, so there's this scene where after Eden gets captured... Um, her and her captain, mm -hmm. who's played by Sean Pertwee, who we will see in Equilibrium. We certainly will. He gets eaten. This is a scene where he gets devoured by a bunch of hungry, angry biker cannibals at a rock show. This is in um, one of Neil Marshall's monumental hybrids of CG and actual yeah. practical effects, right. where he sort of creates the practical effects and then CGs them into the picture. Yeah. I was reading an interview with him uh, probably a couple of weeks ago now. He was talking about how he was a big fan of what I guess is the Ridley Scott school of thought. He was always crediting Ridley Scott. We talked about a little bit when we talked about Alien, uh, Alien when we did the Alien and uh, Predator movies, the bastard Killapalooza that that was, you know, and Ridley had said, if you can shoot it in the frame, if you can get it there in physicality on the set, always do that because it'll hold up over time. Something we have constantly sure. noticed in, in movies we've done before. The Jurassic Park Lawnmower Man show. <laughs> right. Right, that wonderful show. So this is something that Neil Marshall is constantly trying to do in his films, and something Doomsday is a remarkable example of. 
they have an actual castle. Mm-hmm. They have, you know, and we talked about it when we did Small Soldiers, the flaming tennis ball right. scene. You know, how wonderful that is just knowing that someone played flaming tennis ball. It's great watching this road exploitation scene or these castle scenes. That's actually a guy on a horse. Yeah. That's actually, they have these stupid fucking buses that the, the set people decorated, mm-hmm. that the prop department did, and this fancy shiny car. And they're yeah. really doing this stuff. And it's just, that just gives me yeah. so much joy for whatever perverse reason. Right. And the cannibal scene. And they're really cooking and eating sure. him alive. Well, this whole of. scene is prefaced. I, 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 the reason it's called the cannibal dance scene in my brain is because the whole scene is prefaced by a kind of pep rally. Yeah. yeah. Where Saul, who's played by Craig Conway, Amazing. absolutely the fucking greatest character. While we're talking about uh, Rona, Saul reminds me of the guy from The Prodigy. Oh, right, okay. Understood. Yeah, when you remember back to the old videos, like, um, not Spitfire, but what was before that? Firestarter? Firestarter, that was it. And then uh, Breathe in uh-huh. that one as well. Go back and watch those Prodigy videos. It's kind of amazing. Sorry, right. go ahead. Well, we get this scene where Saul is doing a dance number and it starts with, what does it fucking start with? One of the wonderful pieces of uh, non-score, the soundtrack yeah. that uh, that Marshall put right. together, and then it blends into the can can blends right. into in and out of like I'm like who let the dogs out? <laughs> right. I'm sure would probably have popped in there eventually had there right. been enough time. Right. But he's just rolling with it. He's the most charismatic cannibal king yeah. that there could ever be, and he has this speech that I love. That he's talking about how Cain has led them all to believe in falsities and now they're gonna eat a guy yeah medium fucking rare as i've got that, dinner for you yeah as if that's somehow there's a connection there that makes some sort of sense <laughs> so they lower the poor captain into the flames and frisbee paper plates into the crowd so of degrading. angry cannibals that's just i mean insult to injury right yeah. you're just flinging not even real dinnerware paper plates yeah and then they pull out this burned pork looking gross human yeah, right, flesh right. and they devour the guy mm-hmm. and then we get this weird great shot of Saul giving a dead serious look in front of this carnage where you get to see him go with his eyes I am the leader of all of this mayhem right and then he crowd surfs over to sure. the body for you know a good a good man loin yeah right and <laughs> It's just this gross, epic, wonderfully shot scene to show absolute mayhem because, and here's why, the film doesn't give you enough time in any scenario to not really just get a whole right. bulk of right. what's going on in one scene. Yeah, it doesn't linger anywhere too long. Right. Later on, when we go to Malcolm McDowell in The Kingdom, this scene is embodied in the gladiator scene where we get to see eden fight the big knight but that doesn't come right away Mm -hmm. the first shot we see of this weird medieval crossover is when they're in the forest and there's a rumble and oh look out here comes the executioner yeah and you're thinking okay over the hill's gonna come some big fucking cannibal looking yeah you're used to seeing that at this point. club wielding dude well and you have to think about all right so you've just been in what's a 20 minute section of the movie or something that feels like that that ends with a face punch right that is so good by the way that scene the the train or whatever is the period to the end of it is that's the end of cannibals yeah he's mad and he just gets enraged and punches the guy. It's such a wonderful moment. It's really, it's the best part of the film for me. I just love that part. Normally in a movie, you could use some trickery to make someone like Saul seem like a badass in that, in that small period of time. So that the, the actor wouldn't even really have to do most of the job because he's the leader of this big event. The cannibal dance, all the stuff that's going on. So whatever craziness happens there, you will attribute to this one man. And this one man could be William H. Macy. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter. As long as you're attributing it to one guy, you think, oh, well, that guy's a crazy motherfucker. Put on top of that, that this guy is so enthusiastic, has so much charisma to him, that he's doing the same job that the cannibal dance is doing. Yeah. So both of these things could carry the character alone, and they combine to just create... The, I mean, I can't remember ever seeing anything quite like this guy. Yeah. It seems as if they must have had some kind of spittle grill on the camera for all the scenes he was in he's oozing he's quite literally dripping in every scene just eyeliner and a mix of eyeliner and enthusiasm yeah i guess so we move out of that and we feel like even though we got the 
the exclamation point, the yeah. punch period at the end of the cannibalism, you don't believe that it's over. Right. You're now in the Lord of the Rings sweeping mountainous. Yeah. You know, helicopter shots. Well, it's this. It's the same kind of shooting that Neil Marshall did for Centurion. Right. Yet somehow I'm still expecting cannibals. Right. I well, still just think they're going to come out of the woods. One thing you're not expecting is a gigantic man on a gigantic armored horse to come galloping over the hill. Oh, and it's so perfect. And you get this slow motion, iconic fucking shot of Eden standing there holding a gun and this horse braying over her. And the shot is just from below and there's sunlight through the trees. And it's a huge gun, too. It's like some kind of sniper rifle or right, assault rifle right. or something. This huge fucking rifle with this long barrel and right up against the executioner. And it just shows this is what's going on now. There's a fucking night. Deal with yeah, it. Yeah, embrace this part. We're doing something else now. It's telling the audience, try to keep up with the movie. Right. It's instead of going and easing into, oh, here are some poor people. Oh, they look remarkably like peasants from medieval. It's we're in medieval fucking times, <laughs> right. bitch. Right, you don't start at the castle gate and easier. Right, in. so we get brought into Malcolm McDowell's medieval time, and if you're wondering where the castle comes from, it's just a castle, and it's got a gift shop. Yep. There's a gift shop in the castle. But Malcolm McDowell kind of runs this, the Knights and Guns world, where he's talking about what ends up happening in a lot of zombie films now. Where We're some, still talking about a zombie film, by the way. Right, where somebody Where somebody has immunity, their blood is immune to the disease plot device is maybe yeah. that what that's called it's, it, it's the fact that kane is now running a super race of people who are immune to the disease and the power's gone to his head he's given up on his hippocratic oath he is no longer a doctor he is the king of this super race and so sentences eden to fight the executioner yeah because she is impure she doesn't have the pure blood and she needs to die as kind of a statement to the outside world we don't need you we are strong yeah that entire world is really interesting to me because you know we use the term zombie really loosely of course as we always do on the show normally with the zombie movie you're dealing with hordes of the infected all the time i mean that's your your classic uh component that you build the movie on top Mm -hmm. of and in moving around between genres that was my initial reason to think well That's why we don't see a lot of zombies in the movie, even though that's sort of the premise. But also the nature of these zombies is such that it's more to tell you about the environment. Yeah. It's more to tell you the world they live in is where there's remote groups of people. Mm -hmm. So while, uh, say, a Romero zombie movie might focus on the remote group of survivors. Sure. This is a movie where we're talking about remote communities. Yeah. And all over the place. Here's a cannibal community. Here's a, you know, here's a bunch of people living in this castle. These different let's say, um, tribes that go to war. I don't know, two of them. You know, the zombies are just informing more about their, you know, what their life is like Mm -hmm. and why they're, it gives a reason for the Mad Max scenario. It gives a reason for why people live remotely in the desert and why they're all insane and eating each other and very upset about it. So there's this scene where Eden's fighting the executioner. And, I mean, the scene's great. The fight choreography is wonderful Mm -hmm. and it's bloody as fuck. This scene's a really good example when I give uh, a blanket statement, a generic statement, you know, to say Rona is really good in this movie. Isn't it fun to watch her or whatever? When you see a scene like this, it's a great example of where she's carrying. You know, we have a guy in a suit. We don't know who this guy is. We don't care about this guy. Sure, he's a monster. Yeah, he is a monster. And so we're following our Pliskin-esque protagonist who we have to actually give a shit about, who we have to want to see be a badass and overcome the, you know, odd kinky bonded situation Mm -hmm. she's been positioned in earlier in the movie. And so a scene like this wouldn't work unless she was pretty awesome at what she does, which she happens to be. Right. She kicks the shit out of this executioner. She spikes his head in. Mm -hmm. This scene accentuates two things I love about Neil Marshall. One, when someone dies, they're fucking dead. Yeah. In a Neil Marshall film, if someone flips off their motorcycle, they don't hit the ground and you think, oh, they might be hurt. Their neck breaks, you hear it, and you know that fucker just, that's the end of that guy's life. Brutality for every single individual kill. Yeah, it's just, you know when someone dies. It's the necks, right? That's what it's got to be. It's it's just the neck snapping. The The other thing that this scene does, and this is where I kind of have a a side conversation that we need to have. Mm -hmm. She ends this scene. She kills this executioner. 
and then has a quippy one line like, oh, what a rough day. Yeah. So we have this thing that Neil Marshall likes to do where everybody's kind of, especially in Doomsday, it happens in all of his films where an insane amount of action is taking place and people are like, oh, you look like you're having a bad day. Everybody's quipping one lines like this isn't that bad. Yeah. Do you think Neil Marshall is too cheeky the way I think Joss Whedon is too fucking hip? Oh, I see what you're saying. Do you? I, I like the verbiage there, the across the pond verbiage yes. of cheeky. That's good. It's very fitting. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if the way you've positioned that question doesn't lead me to the answer just because I like the, the phrase. I'm sorry. The use of the phrase <laughs> cheeky there. I didn't mean to bait you with my cheeky. chosen vocabulary. You know, it kind of reminds me of when we talked about Dead Alive. Yeah. And not understanding what's coincidentally more across the pond humor. It's certainly something that I can see now that you've said that. Yeah. But I, again, to, to go back to what we were uh, talking about way at the beginning of the show, I wouldn't trade that. You right. know what I mean? That's part of that classical mm-hmm. signature, just in the same way that I could wish Joss Whedon didn't have as much as much quipping in his stuff right and as much of the uh the really hip dialogue because i could show it to people more uh-huh. but every time joss whedon came out with something i could throw that at you and say look how brilliant this is right and you wouldn't have an artificial barrier that we always exactly. have to work past but i don't know what does that look like without the signature you know what i mean yeah is it better or is it just more dull more like everything else i think it probably i think would. you need that yeah i think you're even totally if right. you don't like it yep that's too fucking bad that's part of the signature otherwise it's just more bland and you might not even know about it it might not ever separate itself i feel like you're absolutely correct there neil marshall might just be another guy making pretty good action films and not action films that have that certain you know that certain something else that makes certain us awareness cover them. really yeah yeah Something he's picked up from other movies that he's enjoyed sure. and added his own kind of twist on. Right. It's, you know, it's a critical element of this. Well, and another twist that he adds to something that I love is when he puts a fucking 2009 Bentley on the road with oh, a bunch yeah. of old road sploity muscle cars so full this of cannibals is a, again. This is a great thing to talk about in exceeding what you're stealing from. Right. In going that one extra step, now that we've crafted the environment... We've recreated Mad Max. What can we do that Mad Max didn't do? What can we do beyond Mad Max? Let's just add a car from this year. Sure. Which almost seems like product placement. Yeah, it does. But I looked so hard, and as far as I can tell, there's no product it placement It almost here. looks like a car commercial. Yeah, it does. It, it looks does. like a car commercial with a gimp and a bus full of weirdos. Yeah, so what if you took ye old day of Mad Max and you added... A James Bond spy yep. car. What would that scene look like? Exactly. And now we have that. Now we know what that scene looks like. Thank you, Neil Marshall. It looks great. And I mentioned the GIMP. I don't really... I love the GIMP. I don't know why. Isn't that how it always is? I like that I like that. the last thing that anybody... That's what every group of friends needs, really. You know, you have like a sarcastic guy and an endearing girl next door and then the GIMP. Yeah. So add that to your group of right. friends. <laughs> but I think my favorite thing about this scene... Aside from the fact that Saul is just persistent as fuck hanging off of that car. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> is that in the very beginning when she drives that cop car off the cliff, Neil Marshall goes, I, and it's possible that he doesn't know this. He's not acknowledging this. Neil Marshall in my head is going, cars don't explode when they hit the ground. Right. I've seen Mythbusters. I'm a big fan. Yeah. But I get the weird British announcer and not the American guy that's a lot less egregious. So I'm going to land it in a pool of water and make it splash like it's a fucking explosion. Right, right. Because then you still get the same feeling that the car has exploded, but it's just a splash. The unfortunate nature of road exploitation is that I can't say what show we talked about this on uh-huh. because it'll, it'll completely ruin the ending. And while I love spoiling movies, I do think it's fair to give people the heads up. But uh, we got that classic road exploitation explosion at the end movie, and we talked about that on uh, Double Feature. And this is just another example of modern, more informed sure. take on that. Right. Somebody who saw that movie and would probably do what we do to, to correct mm-hmm. that mistake. Right. So before we move on to Equilibrium, the one thing that we really need to touch on that films seem to be really into doing nowadays is taking John Murphy's 28 Weeks Later score. God damn it. It makes me so mad. Do we need to say anything else about it? Not really. Oh, that's fair, right? I just It's the same progression. It's probably even the same notes. I don't sure. think it even modifies the key. And just kind of changes the timing. Yeah. That's it. People are stealing the score. score. It's, it's happening all Doomsday. the time now. Yeah. Everybody's doing it. 
Stop. Just don't do it, people. Resist. That's it. So the thing about Doomsday, aside from stealing the scores of epidemic films, is that it is an epidemic film. Mm -hmm. And it's all based on this idea that by the end, you get this corrupt official that takes the lead after Bob Hoskins in another shining role kills the prime minister. Yeah. Whoops. So we get this this guy who is now going to just let the disease run its course and thin the herd because pop, it's population control. Yep. It's, it's this weird concept that there is too much going on. There are too many people, not enough jobs, not enough. I don't know. But people, we can stand to lose a few mil. This is kind of the same idea that's going on in Escape from New York is that turns out there's a corrupt official. It's done. It's, it's done a lot differently in right. Escape from New York. But we get the protagonist going and setting it up so that the man has to take the fall. And then she ends up having her own group of motherfuckers to right, go right. and deal with this problem. Yeah. You have this, this idea of power spinning out of control and turning into weird population controlling. And I mean, I don't know. Like, it's clearly very, very, very wrong. But I guess I understand the sentiment this is what always blew my mind about the population control idea yeah. and the, uh, and the, there's too many people on planet earth, but there's not too many people on planet earth. Yeah. We don't have right. an overpopulation right. issue. Humanity will sort it out. Yeah. These, are, it's such a cynical perspective to think that we have, and it's, it's almost ironic because the very problem creates the solution, right? Yeah. So we have so many people on planet earth that we don't have enough people to come up with a solution right. to the problem of so many people yeah. on planet earth. As we've progressed as a civilization, we've consistently gotten smarter and we've had more people that we will look back on, you know, as geniuses, Mm -hmm. as uh, really phenomenal thinkers of their time, as creative people and as engineers, um, the Norman Borlaugs of the world who can solve the the population problems like starvation. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the problems that overpopulation, so-called overpopulation creates is we have so many people, how are we going to feed them all? There's not enough food on planet Earth. There's not enough fertile soil. Thankfully, in this ever-growing number of people on planet Earth, we have an ever-growing number of smart (laughs) individuals, of brains, who can come up with solutions. The cynical people who think overpopulation is a problem seem to not trust in human ingenuity. I just want to officially sign myself up on the other side of that line. Yeah, I think as we grow as a civilization, we will also have more... Smart individuals sure. who can come up with solutions to these problems. The other side of that is that if a government is thinning its population, it's losing power. Right. There's less people. You know, when you have a giant mass of people, then you need a lot more organization for that entire mass to resist mm-hmm. you. If there are three people in your populace yeah. and you're the leader, there's four people total, you the you're the leader stick. over three people. Right, right. And so if two of the three people say, you know what, I think that leader's kind of a dick, let's overthrow him, it's really easy. They, you know, they're always going to outnumber you unless there's just one other person. So that's not the question. But now there's a vast majority and that only needed two people. And if we increase this experiment out to 100 people, to 1,000 people, to a million people, with the larger number of people, the more difficult it probably becomes to overthrow the government, Mm -hmm. the easier control the government has over a populace. Sure. So I don't really understand this idea that keeps cropping up of evil government wants to thin the herd. They lose tax money. They lose number of people whose incomes they are stealing from to to greater grow their own government organization. The whole idea just seems completely fallacious to me. I should I should specify that when I said I understood the sentiment, I didn't mean of the guy. I meant of the film. Right. In this could be something that a government would do. Yeah. Which, I mean, I think the, the whole idea is to paint that man as the most evil, bad sure. guy who sure, it's simple. flies it's gunships in. and For Doomsday, we don't have time to right. show you why exactly. this man is evil. He's thinning the herd. Isn't that a bad thing to do? Exactly. It's weird to end on that idea of kind of totalitarianism mm-hmm. and then just bring that straight up in equilibrium. Right. And already we're getting, you know, equilibrium just starts. We get the Sean Perchway voiceover. Yeah already creating an excellent tie between the two movies. But that also marks the uh, the beginning of 1984. Yes. <laughs> We're just starting already. It doesn't waste any fucking time. We're doing 1984 already. And then right after that, we have the, the scene that's so much... I mean, it's the two-minute hate scene, yeah. right? It just strikes me so much of that. But all right, so in the movie Equilibrium, we have a couple things that are pretty notable outside of the, the overall theme we're talking about today. 
We have Sean Beam playing yes, a hero. We do. Which is an awesome, you know, he is the icon yeah. of the movie. He's the reason that this change kind of starts. Mm -hmm. And to make him an iconic hero, a tragic figure, after his giant wave of 90s films where he was the shady betrayer, he was the villain. And dies. And dies all the fucking time. Just so great for him. What I also love about the scene where he dies, he gets shot through a book. Also mm -hmm. sets the mood for how subtle Equilibrium yeah. is going to be. Shoots him through the book, which also makes a shattering glass sound because everything in the movie makes a shattering glass Everything's sound. Everything's made of glass. Shoots him through a book made of glass. And then right in after he dies, walks Tay Diggs. As if Tay Diggs, his only role as super cop from the future was to follow around you know, our cleric sure. and wait for him to kill his partner sure. and then step up and say, oh, I'm right here. It's kind of like partners are in the cans. You know, yeah, like when you go to right. 7-Eleven and there's a bunch of tea cans and you pull yeah, sure. one out and then the next Another one just one slides just right up. It. That's, that's what, how that's partners are. Thank you. Um, Emily Watson's in the film and beautiful and amazing yes. and charming and doesn't have enough screen time and also has to carry tragedy. There's so many of these roles. I mean, Emily Watson, uh, Sean Bean, the puppy. That have to carry these scenes of great tragedy that mean something so that we can get back to these other points of the movie. You know, and one other person that we have to mention because he shows up randomly. Yeah. And will probably never get the, the time he deserves in movies or on Devil Feature is William Fickner. Right. This guy shows up every time this fucking happens. He shows up in a movie. He has, like a lot of these other actors, very little screen time. Uh -huh. But this is universal for pretty much every movie he's in. Everything I've seen him in, for sure. You know, to think about, I know one we came up with just off the top of our heads was The Dark Knight, because that's a pretty recent right. one. And he's the, the bank guy in mm -hmm. the, the Gotham City bank the manager. The opening scene. And when you see him in these movies, he has these little roles that he shines so much in that you feel as if the movie should actually be about him. Right. That he has a whole two-hour backstory sure. that we didn't see. Sure. It's almost as if whenever William Fickner shows up in a film, you're watching the film, you're along for the ride in Equilibrium, Ultraviolet, Dark Knight, right. The Amateurs, anything. And he shows up and you go, oh, I was watching this movie, but I didn't realize this was just an episode in that guy's miniseries. Right. You right. realize he is the important part of right. whatever you're watching. And this is kind of, oh, some of the side characters have their own lives, but really, right. this is the main guy. We start to think, man, we're following the cleric. We're watching a spin-off. He's, yeah, the cleric is the boring action star, the mundane part. It's this guy who's leading the underground who has 20 minutes in the film. Sure. He's the important guy. You know, you mentioned Ultraviolet. Uh, this is directed by Kurt Wimmer. Kurt's only done, you know, a couple movies that he's directed. He writes quite a bit. Um, but he also did Ultraviolet. And before Equilibrium, he did One Tough Bastard. And so Kurt is the man bringing together all of these different elements. And you'll see some of these things pop up in his other stuff. Uh, a little bit of the gun kata stuff we'll get to kind of shows up in mm -hmm. Ultraviolet as yeah. well. Really the only tie between yeah. those two movies. It's things like this. Having an entire art form, gun kata. That makes the movie seem as if it has way more action than yeah. it does. Yeah, the thing about Equilibrium is it's always billed as this great action movie yeah, that right. does things no one's ever done before. Right, sci-fi action adventure. There are three scenes where people fight. <laughs> right. The rest, Maybe four, maybe four. The rest of the film is these medium close-ups from underneath all right. the actors that make them look like towering behemoths. Right, right. And with insane gravity, mm -hmm. they just talk to each other. <laughs> And there's nothing wrong with that. That's no. great for the movie because sure. you get to discuss all these right. ideas. And That's at, the, at its heart what right. the movie is. The other 30% of the film are suspicious looks from Tay Diggs. Really? Only 30%? I'm going easy on it. I'm going to say 40 to 60 is suspicious looks from Tay Diggs. Well, okay, so one of these scenes, the first scene, and this is really one of my favorites, it's that opening blackout scene. This is a really good example of using a lot of trickery for having such a low budget to create the feeling of more action. You know, we have um, the the entire frame goes black. You sit there for, it's pretty ballsy. I mean, it's yeah. a good amount of time. It feels like a couple minutes. It's obviously not. But mm -hmm. you're sitting there longer than the audience is comfortable for just having complete black. The point in a theater where people start talking to their friends. Right. And then we get some whispers, a lot of really great audio. The great audio that'll carry through the rest of the mm -hmm. movie. And then just brief bursts, almost strobe effects of, you know, the flash from the barrel lighting up the scene. Doesn't cost a lot, looks really showy, looks really awesome, and it's pretty creative, too. Yeah. 
So I guess while I'm giving the movie credit for being creative, this would be a good time to talk about everything it's ripping off, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> you have these themes of, uh, you know, the totalitarian thing is yeah. really big. It's a giant, massive government who has complete control over everybody. They've sedated everybody. You know, the idea is to take these um, these little bits of totalitarianism, of World War II themes, of Hitler, of Stalin, and to bring that stuff, even the fucking Berlin architecture, yeah. to bring that into a futuristic setting and amplify it. And to say, you know, or I guess not even so much to amplify it in this. You really can't amplify World War II, can you? No, I think that was a pretty big deal. But to make it different, to twist it in a way where a modern audience doesn't seem like, oh, we're just revisiting World War II. Right. We get those really, really heavy overtones, but it allows us to reconsider the ideas in sort of a different format. We have a different take on that. These were ideas, of course, that were already reconsidered um, when Ray Bradbury did Fahrenheit 451. Yeah. Uh, both, actually, oddly, these are both things from the 50s. I think that was 51. And then, you know, George Orwell's 1984 yeah, right. was 1948, 1949. That sounds about right. And we never really got up until the point of equilibrium at the mm. very least. Uh, great productions of these. And right. these are both, I mean, two of uh, really my favorites outside of the Ayn Rand stuff. I'm always going on mm. and on about. I mean, especially 1984. I yeah. just love 1984. Orwell's great. Animal Farm, too, man. Neither of these books ever had their starring moment in cinema. Yeah. I mean, there was... Uh, Fahrenheit 451 had a movie made in the 60s. I don't mm -hmm. know if you ever saw that. I think I saw it in brevity. I don't it was think I saw the Oscar, whole thing. Uh, Oscar Werner and Julie Christie. I actually saw the thing, and I, I don't want to... This isn't a point to go on and on about how a British, obscure British made for TV movies in the 60s wasn't very good, right? But yeah. It wasn't, you know, this This is fucking Fahrenheit 451 we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Everyone reads this thing in high school. It's an extremely popular book. How it hasn't been made into an extremely popular movie, completely beyond me. I have no idea. And then you have, you know, George Orwell's 1984 was, uh, there was another British production made in... Brazil? In 1984. Oh. No, not Brazil. It was called 1984. And I'll admit I haven't seen it. It's possible that it's extremely amazing. It's probably not. Best to default on the negative. Thanks. I would have heard about it. You know what I mean? If a if a good film comes out in 1984 about 1984 called 1984 and it's the only movie that's ever come out based on the book, it would be no secret. I like this. I like this. This is uh I completely follow you on that one. You know, so we have countless things that have drawn inspiration from these. My favorite of all time, of course, Year 0. Yeah. Which is uh not as much a movie, um a soon to be mini series. But it was a concept album that was kind of based around the idea of future government doing a lot of what Equilibrium did. Government in the future, total control, people resisting against that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very popular idea yeah. in fiction. It's certainly not the first time it's ever sure. done or ever mimicked. And so Equilibrium is really just another example of that. So the things that set it apart are production. They are the technicality, how you created the tone, what environment you made. Just like when we talked about Doomsday. Yeah. You know, what is that environment? Where does it come from? What does it look like? What does it feel like being there? Do you like watching the movie and being in that environment? Right. You know, is that a, an interesting place that you can go? And whereas we talked about the deserts there, here we're talking about Berlin. We're talking about the, the fucking subway station that they made into their office. Right. Which is great to think you could just go. I've never been to Berlin, but I suddenly want to go, mm -hmm. right? It's a, it's a travel advertisement for sure. Berlin. For these incredibly, you know, they're utilitarian, I suppose, but that might just be because they're, you know, they're shooting in a subway. A right. subway, of course, it looks right. utilitarian. The entire idea of a subway is you have to cover masses of ground and you just make everything look the same. But we do the same thing in costuming and wardrobe. Everybody wears these dull colors and these, they almost look like, um, you know, priest jackets. Yeah. Jackets? Is that what that is? I suddenly sound like I've never been to church and have no fucking clue what I'm talking about. Huh. But it's one of those things that might not strike you right away. And maybe you don't, uh, maybe you don't even think back to Equilibrium as a movie that has a lot of set dressing. Because it is a low-budget movie. It has that kind of minimalistic, um, you know, the same thing that a, a movie like maybe THX had, where it was very cheaply made. And so that also leads to the minimalism, the utilitarian look of it. But especially if you've just seen it, you know, maybe for the show or whatever, consider how much of the tone of the movie is kind of owed to that. Yeah. How much different this would feel if there were people with bright colors or if people just went around their, their normal busy days shopping 
rather than just walking in straight lines. Like they're endlessly going nowhere. You never see anyone go anywhere in yeah. this movie. They go to subway stations. Why do they go to fucking subway stations? They go to their offices, which are also in subway stations. Yeah. They walk up the stairs. There's at stairs. Subway they go stations, up and down stairs. Right? Everyone is just traveling the entire time. No one ever fucking goes anywhere. When they get to their homes, there's nothing in their homes. Mm -hmm. They're completely empty. They sleep on these shitty little beds. They watch um, Total Recall style giant projections of Big you know, the great leader, right? Yeah, <laughs> Big Big Daddy, of course, making me think of Bioshock. But uh, I believe that is Big Brother. Oh, I'm sorry. You're thinking of. Or isn't it First Father in this film? First Father, Big Daddy, Drill for a Hand. Who knows? And so the movie's taking advantage of all of this great and, of course, at the same time, fucking awful architecture that was built by dictators. We have, you know, Hitler's Olympic Stadium. Mm -hmm. I mean, these kind of things that still exist today and we can go there and there's you can kind of take a nice turn on that. We've created this wonderful thing, this movie Equilibrium by utilizing the giant empirical buildings created by dictators in World War II. Way to go, Kurt Wimmer. And then there's the other side. There's the ultraviolet type side. Right. There's the comic book side mm -hmm. of it, which is to, uh, you know, to build up these characters in an environment where a Neil Marshall-esque cheese factor still works. Right. Where a complete absence of subtlety, where these absurd elements still work. And they do that even in visuals. You know, the, the thing we talked about in Sin City, the backlighting that sort of outlines your character. Right. I mean, find a scene in this movie where everyone doesn't have a bright white outline. You know, they play with that even in the opening scenes, um, you know, where the light's literally shining behind right. an, actor's, uh, uh, an actor's head in the context of the movie. But also, just the way the lighting's set up on all of these, they all have a pool of white light sitting on top of <laughs> or directly behind their head like something, you know, like an outline out of a comic book. And I start to wonder if that's an excuse for the type of tricky, cheesy camera work, or if the tricky, cheesy camera work is created in a reaction to that. You know, stuff like the zoom into eyeballs. I mean, right. I don't know if there, there was probably one zoom into an eyeball that was done seriously in a movie from probably what, the 70s, right? Possibly. And then everything after yeah. that looked completely cheesy. But you don't quite know if the movie's aware of how cheesy it's being or if maybe the voiceover was put in later because they had all these these cheesy eyeball shots. Because Blade and they Runner. Needed, yeah, and they needed to... That's why it was there. It was there because of Blade Runner. That's actually the reason. So you have these zooms into eyeballs that fade into other shots, or you see something in an actor's eye. Or the um, the one that's really interesting is a blended split focus shot yeah. that's used. You usually see the harsh you know, line between split focus. That was used decades ago, and now we use it almost you know, in homage or to mock it. But we've kind of blended that here digitally, which is interesting. Or the one that probably stands out the most is where they show that frame of the gun right after it's been fired. Mm -hmm. And it looks like the gun has been fired straight, but the camera cocks at a 45 degree angle to show you that in fact the gun has been fired up in the air. And then it kind of pans out to show you that, to reveal the entire context of the frame. And while I mock it for being cheesy, that's actually a pretty clever gimmick. Yeah, You know, we're always complaining about these, these meat cart kind of gimmicks. Um, where movies will do the same same trick that's been used for years and years and years. And so we want to pull off the same dumb move here. We want to make it look like, oh, he shot her. Doesn't that change everything? And we can't actually have that character die at this moment. So we want to give the audience that feeling. We don't actually want to, you know, suck it up and, and kill our female lead yeah. already. So instead, we show the gun from a strange angle and mm -hmm. we kind of tilt it. We lie about the angle of right. the gun. Right. Right. And that's creative. And I think sure. that should be applauded. I agree. So we're talking about the gun stuff so much. We should probably just talk about gun kata, right? Because everyone gun wants kata. to know about it. That's uh, something that you remember from this movie. Yeah. The idea is what the ninja projection guns. trajectory of the something the movie wanted with Angelina yeah. Jolie whip bullets around. Also, the Mythbusters corner. proved that that doesn't quite work. So this is beautiful. Let me set up this picture for you. So Kurt Wimmer crafted this idea of, you know, people sort of dancing as they're you know, firing bullets at each other. Mm -hmm. He crafted this in his backyard. He talks about this on the, uh, on the commentary on the DVD about waiting for the neighbors to leave and make sure nobody's at home. Can you just imagine Kurt Wimmer probably what, in his pajamas at, I don't know, three in the morning doing ballet in his backyard, making <laughs> noises. <laughs> little, what is this? Emotion. It's a finger bang is what it is. What do you call this? Handgun. You know, with his hand in the shape of a gun. It's, it's as absurd as half the shit that goes on yeah. in this movie. But I guess his idea of doing that was when you look at the evolution, the natural progression of the gunfights in cinema, 
you have um, that Hong Kong style that added the second gun. Uh -huh. And now people are firing two guns. And that's something interesting and new we can do, you know, before just having the one gun. Mm -hmm. Now we can have guns blazing with handguns. We don't need giant rifles for that. We can use handguns and you look like a badass. Mm -hmm. And so Hong Kong pioneered this and used it for a long time. And then the U.S. stole it. We added our own unique take later where people would turn their gun to the... It's funny, I just went to make that gesture yeah. and I automatically turned it to the side. But you would take the gun and you would turn it at a... 90 uh, degree angle. Yeah, and it makes you look more like a badass. Mm -hmm. That's how a thug shoots his gun. Sure. And so now we see that all the time. And everybody shoots a gun at a 90 degree angle in cinema. That's just what happens. And he talked about how there were no great developments in gunfighting after that. Yeah. Once we figured out we could rotate the gun, that was it. That's as much as we progressed. So he decided that you know he wanted to... Do something new and something innovative. How would people shoot guns in the future? And so he created this idea of gun kata, which is funny. And I don't even know if he realizes that he's sort of combining what we think of, maybe not necessarily as Hong Kong styles uh -huh. of, of movies. But when you look at the old exploitation stuff, the Kung Fu stuff. Yeah, it looks like Kung Fu with guns. Well, and more importantly, it fucking sounds like Kung yeah, Fu. Yeah, it does. There are so many limb swinging sounds. Yeah. It, it's you're watching a kung fu movie yeah. at that point it's ridiculous and uh you know the designs of the guns are unique too as the, is the design of every goddamn thing in this movie you have the angular pieces that come off the bottom of the muzzle uh sliding out from the yeah. sleeves especially shown off during that uh the very last of the four fight scenes mm -hmm. in the movie you know they don't have a lot of these scenes but when they do the choreography is not only is it really great in the movie, but they make a point of having a plot element about it. They make yeah. a point of gun kata being a thing just to say, hey, watch out for the choreography in this movie. There's a reason people are dancing around as they fire at each other. Okay, so we've talked about all of the, other than, I guess, gun kata. Right. We've talked about what the film takes from other stuff. Right. What does it do on its own, though? Okay, so that becomes the big question, right? The same question with Doomsday and the, the ultimate answer to why these movies should exist. The justification, I guess. Here we go. And while it's the most simple, I think this has to be some of my favorite on-screen violence of all time. You know, I joked about the breaking glass sound showing up all the time. Mm -hmm. But you'll notice that they go out of their way to make sure there's glass in yeah. all of the action scenes. Even when there's a fucking firing squad. Yeah. Why do you put a firing squad in front of a giant glass? Why is that glass window even there in a basement no idea. of some warehouse somewhere? It doesn't even make sense to be there. But we've realized that the sound of glass uh, breaking as you're firing shots just feels more brutal. It feels more violent. And so we're going to put it in every shot, so to speak. You know, you even get a breaking glass sound because apparently the motorcycle helmets, for safety reasons, are made out of glass now instead of, you know, windshield plastic or whatever. Uh, we get that breaking glass sound when he's firing through there. We get the giant muzzle flare. Handguns are basically machine guns in this movie. Uh, and the sound mix is great. You get the glass. You get um, even what I like even better is the bullet cases ringing out as they hit the pavement. It just sounds like someone has dropped a fistful of change on uh, the floor. And then occasionally there are those sprays of red blood mist. Yeah. You know, you break someone's arm and... You can just tell they're on the set or maybe in post they're going, oh, fuck, that, there's no glass or shooting involved in that. What are we going to... There's actually karate instead of firing guns. That's something in regards to gun kata we didn't see coming. How do we make that feel more violent? And so limbs just spray, just yep. spray blood through the suit. So, I mean, it's definitely not subtle. Yeah. But what I do love, and I know I keep hammering at home on all these movies we do, but it's serious. It's not subtle. It's always serious. And that to me is comedic. And I know sometimes I find things comedic on the show that aren't intended to be comedic. But let me just lay this out for you for a second. We have this puppy scene, right? I mean, this is such complete exploitation. You know, he finds these, uh, these animals, right? And they're going to exterminate the animals. They're exterminating the animals, Michael. Not okay. And so he picks up this puppy. I'm just going to take this and we, well, I got to test it for diseases yeah. or something. Go back Carries it away at arm's length. Right. Meanwhile, so... Tay Diggs thinks something may be up. Something might be amiss. Right. Just take that frame and just show that to someone and they will right. laugh. It's the, in the context of this serious movie, this art film. It's the only thing it. that's not blue and black in the entire <laughs> scene. Right. Is this little fucking puppy. And that's not even the most ridiculous scene with a puppy right. in this movie. Right. There's a scene after that that's even, you know... When he's smuggling the puppy and, you know, the, he flips, um, 
He flips the guns around uh, once he's been caught. What? And fires through the guy's helmets. Yeah, and you get that excellent. The guy doesn't even know what to say because he's just so. Fu- they, this was so unexpected. It's not. God damn it! Look out! Run for cover! It's just what? And so he jumps some motorcycles. He drops eight guys using his gun karate. They cut to this post-fight sort of ballerina pose that he makes. Yeah. And then, as if that wasn't ridiculous enough, they cut to sparks shooting out from behind his head. And, you know, the, the music cue kind of drops, and it's the end of the badass moment. But then the very beginning of the next part is, you know, you think this can't get any worse, and he bends over, and he picks up a puppy and brings mm-hmm. it into the frame. It is so fucking absurd. And so just the way we talked about cheeky neil marshall right the uh the comedic sense of this film whether it's intentional or not is something i never remember going back to the film and always enjoy every time i see it yeah definitely not intended as comedy is when he gets back to his house yeah and they're gonna search his house just as a formality just I, as a formality i know we mentioned 20 this minutes on a scanner darkly but I never get enough of that. You can justify fucking anything to Literally, any person. Literally, you can justify fucking anything. <laughs> right. I uh, got my... Sorry, I'm fucking this tree. Just formality. Be done in 20 minutes. Right. And then, oh, yeah, it's a format. Oh, it'll take about 20 minutes. Well, that's a little less than desirable, but okay. I guess You I'll have to... to follow up your formality with a time frame. You do. And it you always do. has to be about five minutes longer than you know they want. Right. You know, if you're... Hey, yeah, I got to use your bathroom. Just a formality, but it'll be 10 minutes. Yeah, right. Well, that's not cool. Five minutes, okay yeah five minutes in the bathroom i get it but 10 come on man i'm gonna go inside your house and smash random possessions just a formality uh it's gonna take about 18 minutes just a formality you fucking get away with murder so we should move on but as a formality it's only gonna take like three minutes we're gonna talk about the fact that we have a website doublefeatureshow.com mm-hmm. an email which is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com send us your formalities and their time limits oh, if you beautiful. feel like doing that beautiful find us on iTunes you can leave us a review on iTunes or if you want to donate you can send these motherfuckers some donations here these motherfuckers being us right we're the motherfuckers in this scenario we're gonna fuck your mother just a formality 25 minutes some of the people who donate uh, two of you actually will be picked to figure out what the fuck we're doing for the end of the show. Cool. So when you keep badgering us about, please do this great double feature idea I have, that's how you get that done. Blade Runner and the man with new shoes. Oh, God. But that's not what we're doing next week. No, what are we doing next week? Next week, we're going to cover Look, which is an Adam Rifkin, and Pecker, which is a John Waters. Bringing the John Waters in early this year. I like it. Look is also a little bizarre. Uh, I'll give people a heads up about Look, because it's a really... It's a weird film, and I just, I just be ready for anything All right. when you watch it. That's all. Be prepared and watch more fucking film. Bye.